So welcome, everybody. Essentially, what we're going to be covering today, we'll have to uh, be respectful. There will be people, no doubt, jumping on as we go. And uh, so we'll see them once we go through this morning. So what I've done is I've put together essentially a whole host of information um, in that I've now been coaching for 21 years and I've now been teaching neuro-linguistic programming for 19 years. When I started, I never thought I'd be coming out with numbers like that, you know, further into my career. In fact, as I was growing up, I didn't think I was going to make it past 21 So uh, here I am on my 61st year of life and and we're doing uh, another breakthrough. So today what I wanted to do is I wanted to share with you some insights that I've learned over the years so that you can get a sense of more of the what. So today we're going to cover a lot of what. You know, how do we get our brain ready for a breakthrough? What do we have to know? What do we have to do? And so we're going to be covering a lot of what. Now, tomorrow, what we're going to do, same time, 9.30 through to noon, we're going to be focusing more on processes, techniques. So today, what I really want you to do is to really think about essentially where do you want to break through in your life? You know, where where do you want that breakthrough? You know, it might be in your health, it might be in your wealth, it might be in your relationships, or it might be in your career or your business, or something along that particular line. You know, contextualize it, work out where you specifically want to get the breakthrough in your life. Then following that, then start to think about what do you need to condition, you know, sort of what specific area do you need to focus on in that context? So, for example, let's say if if it's your business, let's say you want to have a breakthrough in your business, you want to grow your business somehow. The thing to think about is think about where specifically in your business, do you actually want to have that breakthrough or what's going to be the low-hanging fruit or what's going to be the biggest opportunity? And then consider why are you not breaking through that particular area? So today I'm going to be covering very much a great deal about mindset and a great deal about getting you ready more so for tomorrow. So tomorrow is going to be very much, we're going to be doing a lot of exercises, a lot of processes to help to condition your thinking. So for example, one of the things that I find has been a huge, huge help to me over the years is we know that essentially our senses determine how we become who we become. You know, in other words, you know, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we touch, what we taste, what we smell and equally what we intuit. So these things become and form our experience. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail around this today. So these things really can form our experience. And then once we build this experience, of course, we become that person that has been evidenced so much through our lives. So essentially, What I want to do is I want you to firstly understand how we become who we become, know exactly where you want to direct your energies towards, you know, the breakthrough that you really want to have. And then we're then going to go further in helping you to condition your thinking around that. So leading on from what I was suggesting is something that I do on a regular basis is Thankfully, you know, through the years, I've been trained with neuro-linguistic programming. I've been trained with hypnotherapy, clean language, you know, EFT, TFT. I've learned so many things over the years. And one of the commonalities, one of the things that exists in many of the modalities is typically the way that we communicate. It's language. You know, if you go in to see a kinesiologist, you know, they're going to work with you with language. You work with an NLP practitioner, they're going to work with you with language. Even if you go see a GP, you know, sure, they have the additional elements of some of the chemistry that they may add. But at the end of the day, the whole communication piece, the whole transitional piece is all language. 
So something that I typically will do quite often is I will create audios for myself. And of course, I've created a numerous number for my clients over the years. So what I'll do is if I'm looking to transition or if I'm looking to move through a challenge, I will typically put the right language continually into my mind. So for example, if I wanted a breakthrough in in business, I would have to ask myself, why am I not breaking through that area of my business? And let's say, for example, let's say, you know, I've, I, I, I'm shy. Let's say I'm really shy. I'm lacking self-esteem or I'm lacking confidence. And because of that, I'm not putting myself out there. You know, I'm kind of hiding more than putting myself out there. And as a result of that, then I know that what I've got to do is I've, I know what I've got to do. I've got to put myself out there. So the words or the processes that I will use is about conditioning my thinking, beginning to change my inner dialogue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you all, if you haven't already, to mute yourself, and then I'm going to go into some PowerPoints. But before we go there, what I'll also do is I'll just put in the chat, just in case you haven't been able to um, have been able to get the manual, I'll send through to you in the chat right now where you can actually do that. So there's a place there on the breakthrough page where you can actually download the manual if you haven't been able to do that. Also, I've also put, if you have any questions after breakthrough, I've actually put my email there. So you can then ask me anything that you want to ask me after breakthrough if there were some questions there for you. Also, I put in the chat, if you wanted any personal help or you want to reach out and say, Rick, how do I break through this or how do I get through that? We have a thing called a solutions page. Now, on that particular page, you can click on that link. Actually, I'll share some of these things so you can see exactly what they look like. So let me dive around uh, my screen at the moment. And um, so what I'm going to do is jump to here. So firstly, this is the this is the breakthrough page that you registered on. And down here is a video that shows you how to actually download the manual. And over here is this link will take you to a Dropbox account. So you just click on that. It then takes you to Dropbox. There now is your manual being loaded onto Dropbox. And you just click up the top left, and that's a download link. So that's just in case you haven't been able to get the manual. So the other thing that I wanted to show you is I wanted to show you the solutions page. So I'm just going to go to Life Beyond Limits and forward slash solutions. So there we go. So basically, this is a page that essentially is our page if anyone needs some help. So we usually allow for not that many, but it's usually about four or five a week that uh, can access our, our diary. So once you get to here, you put click on the claim your free call And then, as you can see, there's nothing in my diary, but next week there perhaps will be. There we go. There's a whole bunch of spots in my diary. And if that week doesn't suit you, you just go to the next week and so forth. So that's essentially how you can connect with me in those number of ways. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into Breakthrough. Now, I've been incredibly, if you've printed out the manual, you know I'm being incredibly ambitious to cover off a lot of material over these two days. Um, Ideally, I would have loved to actually had you here for a whole day and tomorrow a whole day. Uh, However, many of my mentors suggest that I'm asking for far too much. So they said, no, 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 Rick, keep it to about two and a half hours maximum. And uh, hence, that's why we've had uh, two and a half hours Saturday and two and a half hours on Sunday. So there's a lot that I wanna get through. 
So I'm going to dive into my PowerPoints now and uh, start to go through breakthrough with you. So bear with me as I go to the current slide. So essentially, this is breakthrough day one. And so what we're going to do on the Saturday, we're going to be covering a lot of what, you know, what is mindset day. So we're going to be focusing very much on mindset. I'm hoping to give you some insights as to how we become who we are today. Tomorrow is the how. So on the Sunday, we're going to be going through breakthrough day. So that's going to be me working very much as a coach, as a trainer, as a therapist to help you to understand how do you, how do you switch? What are the conditions how do you actually switch frame, switch perspective, and be able to break through your limits? So, of course, we've got the workbook there. And uh, at the top, right, whenever I'm referring to a particular thing in the workbook, you'll see the green numbers. So that will tell you where we're working in the workbook. You, you will have noticed that I've left some things out of the workbook so that what you can do is write in the workbook. And the purpose for that is just writing helps to build greater depth of understanding. So hence, that's why we've created some blank areas. And you can see things, that, you know, the blue areas, you can put information in there and the dotted areas, usually you can put some extra information in there, but it's pretty uh, self-explanatory when you've gone through the manual. So, um, and of course, that's where you can download it if you haven't already. So it's lifebeyondlimits.com.au forward slash breakthrough. So from that, there's also a video if you want to know how to actually break, break through. We've been very, very busy in putting all these bits and pieces together to help to make the experience good for everyone. So the first thing is intention and aim. You know, why are we running breakthrough after seven years? Well, there's a very good reason for that. And that is because, you know, at the end of the day, there are many, many people who really don't want you to be free, you know, and I'm not going to go too deep into this. It does go down a very dark rabbit hole. And I don't want to go down that very dark rabbit hole today at Breakthrough. But there are many, many people who are basically creating a, a world that is anything but free. Um, this year and next year, they have an incredible number of plans as to what they're doing to take many of our liberties away from us. Now, I work with a spiritual coach as well as a, 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 an NLP coach. And something that my spiritual coach has helped me to understand is she said, Rick, your job in these coming years is to help as many people navigate their way out of what's coming, you know, and help them to understand how to be. Today is part of that. You know, it's about really helping you to be the best version of yourself. So, Essentially, breakthrough is really to give you insights and tools and strategies to help you to get mastery over your mind, your money, and, and your life in general. And also to learn why your unconscious limits and can thwart your future. So one of the things that I care a lot about, one of the things that I have a big passion for is helping people to become leaders, leaders in their own life or leaders for others. Now, um, at the end of the day, I really do believe that freedom is a life beyond limits and it's getting beyond your limits when you feel like you can do anything, achieve anything, make anything happen. So essentially, we're going to take an NLP approach, of course, which is neuro-linguistic programming a practical approach, I want to give you many strategies that I have been using in my life to really help my life in so many ways. And also, we're going to cover a metaphysical. And the metaphysical, I'm hoping to actually get there today so that um, we can, so you, you'll have a, a great understanding as to how to help you to feel better 
and also to know what are the indicators? How do you measure? How do you measure better? You know, how do you know when you are actually at the most resourceful place that you can be? So first of all, who I am and why I do what I do for those who don't know me that well, I'll be sharing much of what I've learned in the 21 years. So uh, my name is Rick Schnabel, for those who don't know me that well. And I graduated as a coach in 2002. And I also graduated uh, as an NLP master trainer in 2004. But what a lot of people don't know is I kicked and screamed and resisted going into that coaching space for probably a good five or six years. Um, the only reason was I could not get my head around, you know, um, I had limiting beliefs, I had limiting ideas, and I thought to myself, how do you actually, how are you able to be able to, you know, run your life financially as a coach? Because when I first started looking at being a coach, coaching was very new. And many people didn't know what it really was. Many people didn't know how you commercialize that, how you even survive financially being a coach. So I just thought to myself, you know, uh, back then I was earning a ridiculous amount of money. When I say ridiculous, it was at the low end. I was earning like, you know, about 80 odd thousand dollars or something like that. And I thought to myself, how am I going to earn that as a coach? Um, in my first year of coaching, we almost earned half a million dollars. So it was a ridiculous idea, but I didn't know. I didn't know. Now, um, I became a master NLP trainer with Life Beyond Limits. We founded that particular company in 2004 with a vision that we wanted to help as many people as we possibly could to go beyond their limits to, you know, share many of the tools that I had learned you know, up until 2004 and continued learning. So I taught NLP, life coaches and speakers uh, from 2006. Once we got to uh, 2008, we started teaching trainers. And uh, personally, I love transformational work. I've been doing it, as you know, for 21 years, and I'm now up to, you know, over 38,000 uh, one-on-one type hours, transformational work type hours. So you've got to love what you do to do that much time in one particular space. I've written six best-selling mindset books. Uh, Life Beyond Limits was my very first book. Um, it was going to be called A Ridiculous Name. And I'm so glad that my publisher said that's a ridiculous name. You should call it Life Beyond Limits. It was one of the best things that ever happened to us. And, uh, and then I wrote uh, a number of other books. Just so you get a sense, the reason I write books and specific books is because I get this intuitive idea about what I think my leaders need. So I wrote The Power of Beliefs when I had so many of my students and trainers and leaders who were saying, I really want to understand beliefs to greater detail. And I went hunting books that would talk about beliefs. And I frankly didn't find one that I felt went deep enough. So I wrote The Power of Beliefs. Then I got to a point where I was teaching so many people, particularly a lot of coaches and, and trainers. And these people had really good experience. You know, they, they knew their skill. They were very, very good at their skill, but they were scared to put themselves out there. And so for my student group, I wrote the book Raw Courage, uh, you know, which is all about being courageous. Then I had coaches saying, you know, how do you really get to, you know, six figures, seven figures as a coach? How do you do that? And then I wrote The Life Coach, Millionaires. Now, uh, a richer way to think is, ex well, it's not exactly, but it's, it's very much a replication of Life Beyond Limits. It was rebadged, re rebranded, and rewritten to become a richer way to think. Then um, last year, I had so many of my students saying, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to be successful. And, uh, and so I wrote Five by Five to Thrive. So 
that's essentially how I write my books. I write my books very much based on my students. Uh, my students are my first love. I put most of my heart, most of my energy into my students because as a result of that, they go out there and they help many people. And I'm a humanitarian. I care deeply about you. I care deeply about the world and the state of the world. And a lot of people say to me, they say, Rick, aren't you a coach? And I say, yes. And they say, why do you teach coaches? Why do you do that? Doesn't that doesn't make sense business-wise? Why do you do that? And I said, well, the reason I do that, and your comment tells me you don't get what I why I do what I do at all. I do that not because I'm creating more competition for myself, as you know what they're alluding to, but I do that because the world does need more coaches. You know, currently, um, a lot of people say to me, they say. You know, aren't there too many coaches now? And I go, well, if you really look at the statistics, um, based on the number of accredited coaches, there is one accredited coach for about 300,000 people. Now, I can only take on about 50 clients a year. That's it. So there's no way I could take on 300,000 clients a year. So there still isn't enough coaches in the world. Uh, I also have a radio show called Business Matters. It's uh, I used to have a show called My Matters. I decided to uh, get rid of that show and start a new one called Business Matters with um, Jackie Smith, who's my co-host. Uh, we do that every Monday morning uh, at Sapphire FM. And uh, also I teach uh, life coaching, master coach, speaker training, and trainer training. And for Breakthrough, what I'm also doing, if anyone wants to do any of those courses, we decided to create a 30% off for all of those courses. So that's the discount code, 30% off Breakthrough. And uh, so that's available to you until midnight, Sunday, the 2nd of April. And uh, so that's the code, 30% hyphen off hyphen breakthrough. And that's a coupon code that you use on our website. But I'll talk more about that tomorrow. So um, basically, all the links to these programs are in your workbook, but I'll put them in the chat as well. So here is essentially, this is one class that I ran, uh, and we, in this particular class, we had 31 students, and out of those 31 students, out of them, there was 21 people out of there who are now today transformational leaders. They're people who are doing a lot of good on the planet, and that was just one class, you know, so we have trained so many people who are out there doing talks, writing books, etc. Now, firstly, the people who are not circled, you know, it's not because they're not as good as the leaders or anything like that. They just made a different choice. They did the courses essentially because they wanted to improve themselves. They didn't want to go out there and help others. But I would argue that every single one of those people that are not circled have helped someone in their life with what they have learned. This is why I do what I do. And I want to teach as many people as I possibly can how to be an influential change agent in the world. So we base ourselves upon the things that we call facts. So many of the facts that we have in our brain pretty much determine who we actually are. So, for example, here here are a few examples. So, you know, this might be a fact. You know, someone might say, I'm not smart enough to understand computers. And that becomes a limiting belief, as we know, but it's also a fact according to that particular person. Now, the moment that's a fact, that person has created a lot of challenge for themselves, particularly when it comes to computers. Now, that would be terrible if that person went into a career that had anything to do with a lot of computer use. 
you know, sometimes kids say, you know, I'm not good enough to play sport, you know, and that can certainly create a decision in their life where they choose to walk away from something that they might love or, you know, choose to walk away from sport or lower their self-esteem as a result. You know, where others can say, you know, I'm not strong enough to take criticism, you know, and the frame I am is the most powerful frame that you can use. Like whatever you say after I am is incredibly powerful. So I hear it all the time. I hear people say, I am not good at remembering names. And as a result of that, of course, what they're telling their unconscious brain is whenever they hear a name, they go, forget it. I'm not going to remember it anyway. You know, and so they are instructing themselves for limiting beliefs. You know, but even if the facts are not positive, you can still make positive decisions from them. You know, so you might you might have facts that are not exactly positive, but it doesn't mean you can't make positive decisions from them. So, for example, here are some seven things that I know that I believe are facts. And that's just according to my frame, my reference. Now, um, and we just got a little bit of noise. So if you're not unmuted, if you could just perhaps um, mute yourself just so we can get rid of the little noises that are happening. So now um, add what you think are the positive decisions in the chat based upon what I'm about to share with you. So the first thing that I believe that I know is your unresolved fears chase you all your life. So your unresolved fears chase you all your life. So what is a positive thing that you could do based on that? If you believe that your unresolved fears chase you all your life, what could be a positive step that you could take? Okay, I'm going to go first. So I'm going to put in the chat... overcome your fears. So if if that's a belief, if we really believe that, that your unresolved fears chase you all your life, then you can basically do something to get rid of your fears. And, you know, M has put coaching, understand your fears, you know, and that might be the first step. Begin to understand what those fears are and then make a choice to begin to get beyond those particular fears. So here's another one. You don't get what you want or need, but you do get what you expect. So it's it's something that I have come to believe over the years. A lot of people have wants and they have needs, but The things that wants and needs typically do, if we think about the languaging and we really get to what does that mean when I say I want or what does that mean when I say I need? And what we really get from that is what we're actually literally saying to ourselves is that we do not have these things in our life. You know, whatever it is, what we want or whatever we need. So, What can we do from a positive perspective when we believe that everything that you want or need is not as probable than the things that you expect? So what could you actually do in a positive sense that if what you don't want or need is typically what you won't get, but what you expect is what you will get? What can you do? to really make that. And what we've got is uh, change your belief around deserving those things. Change what you expect. Change your expectations. Live, Live as if you have it. So these are great answers. Understand that the past does not always determine the future. Notice what you're noticing. 
Awesome. These are great answers. Fantastic. So let's move to the next one. You are here to experience and mostly to learn. Um, let me give you a little bit of insight into this. Something that I've come to discover over my life is that typically what happens is we can have experiences and some of those experiences might not be great experiences. However, for those of you who are NLP trained, you will know of one tool called Timeline. And that particular tool has a very important component within it, and that is the learning space. It's where we rise above our problems and we aim to actually learn from them. So if you totally believe that you are here to experience and mostly to learn, even from your bad experiences, totally. And uh, Danny said, learn to love. Very good answer. And also learn that everything may not be bad. It may be a learning opportunity. So another thing that I've come to believe as a fact is when you do the inner work, your outer world changes. So uh, Andre put every experience as a lesson. Morris put focus on the positive. Absolutely. These are great answers. So when you do the inner work, your outer world changes. So what could be a positive that you could put to that? So when you do the inner work, your outer world changes. So what would you suggest you could do in that context? So we've got learn, learn what you can from your experiences. Try not to kid yourself. Absolutely. And I would say another answer there is do the inner work. If your outer world does not reflect the world that you truly want for yourself. Your thoughts and feelings vibrate and attract. Now, if that's true, if your thoughts and feelings turn into vibration or frequency or hurts or whatever you want to call it and attracts that Phil has said, every thought start the reality. So every, every thought will initiate your new reality. Now, this is something that um, many of you know a story that I will share quite frequently. It was a time in my life when I was down to my last $27 and doing very badly financially in my world. So what I got a sense of, finally, the big shift, the big shift for me was that I recognized that my thoughts and feelings had created my result. And I decided to change my thoughts and feelings and change for good. So you manifest what you feel, not, you, not what you think. So you manifest what you feel, not think. So if feelings are so important, then what therefore is more important to your thoughts? Let's call it this. Everything that leads to your feelings. Everything that leads to your feelings determines the results you get. Many years ago, I remember working in an organization and uh, I was right next to the sales department. And I could hear a lot of the conversations that they were having in the sales department. And there was one guy in the sales department, the guy who ran the department, who he had a saying that he used to repeat again and again. Whatever he heard from someone, he would often say, good, good. Good, good. And he just kept saying, good, good. And it used to drive me nuts just hearing him say, good, good to everything. But this was way before I understood what our language and our feelings ultimately do. And his world was fantastic. Everything was good, good in his world because he just kept telling himself, good, good. And everyone else around him, good, good. Everything was good. Now, most breakdowns happen before we get a breakthrough. So most people will often go through a, a breakdown before they actually get to a breakthrough. So 
if that is a fact, then what can we do in order to ensure that we get breakthroughs without the breakdowns? The answer there is kind of rhetorical. It is get the work, do the work, you know, to make sure you're not leaving it until the very last moment. So this was me back in uh, when I was 27, I think I was, around this particular part of my life. These are some of my facts. I believed that everyone is out to get me in this world, you know, and, of course, I was gotten a lot of the time. I also believe that I'm poor because I come from working class. And I believe that I would never be anything different and that would become my outcome. Another fact I had was I'm stupid because a teacher said so. And these were very much the, the three prime facts that were governing my life. And the truth is all facts are innocent until proven guilty. And the thing was, these three facts led me down horrible paths. So the thing is that when we look at our facts, my question to you is, are there any facts in your life that really don't serve you? Things that you absolutely believe are factual. So um, the thing that I'm going to get you to think about is I'm going to get you to have a little chat. So have a talk about this, you know, and, and just for, we'll make this a little, you know, get to know someone in the group and uh, we're going to create a little breakout. So we're going to have a little bit of a chat time. And I want you to think about, are there any facts that don't serve you? Now, how, here, here's a way to think about this. Think about an area in your life where things are not working, you know, things are not working as you really would imagine them to work. And then consider, you know, what are the facts that you're tending to believe as being facts that is causing this to happen? So I'm going to stop share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create our very first breakout room. So let me get the numbers right here. So there we go. And uh, whoops, I've gone too far. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign you automatically. And uh, this is going to be a very short little breakout. So I'm going to give you about, uh, let's call this seven minutes. So it's going to be a little seven-minute chat. So I'm going to open up the breakout, the breakout, and then I want you to go into the breakout room and have a little chat. Get to meet the person first and then have a chat. So basically, let's see. Let's make sure this is working. Okay, so... Looks like it's working, so... It is cool. So everyone... Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, we've got Kathy in a room on her own. So there we go. So feel free to jump out into the breakout and I'll them. Cool. Welcome back, everybody. So did you all get some answers, which is helpful? Cool. So essentially, one of the most important things that I often find from a perspective of coaching is when you're actually working with somebody, the first thing that you typically want to be able to do is you want to be able to determine what is the thing, you know, the very thing that is actually stopping you or hindering you or holding you back. And so determining things such as what are the facts that we're holding on to that is causing us some challenge in our lives is a really big, great starting point or a really good beginning. So what I also want to add to this is I also want to add another question to begin to think about. 
So the next question that I want you to think about is this. Why did you join Breakthrough? You know, what was your motive? What was your idea? What was your focus? So let me give you a bit of an insight into this. This is the eighth thing that I completely believe. And that is your why is your greatest motivator. Now, something that I've noted from, you know, doing so much coaching over the years is I've had success with the majority of my clients. You know, we've gotten to where we said we wanted to get to. However, there are the, the odd situations where you feel like you're not really getting too far. And the answer to that quite often is in the motive of your client. In, in other words, we can have some secondary gain by not achieving. We can also have some uh, fear that may be associated with achieving. You know, fear of success, for example, is, is one way to think about it in a broad sense. And something that I discovered from one of my early mentors is my early mentor, whenever I came out with an idea, he would say, why? Why do you want to do that? What is the actual value that you will gain? What is your pure intent? Why do you want this? And it, I discovered that the things that you really want the most are the things that typically have a big why associated with them. Now, um, if you are clear why you are here, you will get much more from it because you will be saying to yourself, why I'm here is I want to get a financial breakthrough. Why I'm here is I want to get a health breakthrough. Why I'm here is because I want to get a relationship breakthrough or whatever it may be in your life. And the more specific you can get, the absolute better. So I want to introduce you to a gentleman that came to a breakthrough and he couldn't answer that question. He was sitting in the audience and he, in fact, had to come to two breakthroughs before he really found his why. Now, his, his name is Hector, but this is the testimonial that he gave me after going on from a breakthrough and coming into our NLP program. And he basically doubled his income. That was his outcome. But at breakthrough, we got to a point in breakthrough where he said to himself in his head, and he shared this with me later, he said, why am I here? You know, why am I here? And we got to a point in breakthrough where I said, look, I want to show you how quickly you can change your mind. And I'm looking for somebody who doesn't want to drink something anymore or doesn't want to eat something anymore. They want it out of their lives. And in NLP, we call it a like to dislike. It's a process that you can take someone from something that you totally love, but let's say you're addicted to it and you can't seem to quit it or can't seem to give it up. And it's a technique to help a person to get rid of something that they love and turn it into something that they no longer love or perhaps no longer want at all. Now, I went around the room and I was looking for volunteers and Hector actually thought, yeah, what the hell? He put up his hand and I went around the room and asked a bunch of people what they wanted to get rid of. Hector was the first person I asked and he said coffee. He said, I want to stop drinking coffee. And I thought to myself, and this is in my head, I thought, oh, geez, I've done coffee so many times. Give me something more entertaining than coffee. I want to work on something different this time. But I continued with Hector and I said, so tell me, how much do you want to get rid of coffee? Stop drinking it in your life. And he said, a great deal. And I said, so tell me, how, how many coffees do you have in a day? I can't remember the exact precise number, but it was kind of like about 12 cups of coffee. 
So he was drinking coffee all day long. He didn't drink water. And uh, he just drank coffee. And I remember his skin was very gray and he didn't look very healthy. So given my first thought, give me someone else, I don't want to do coffee, I thought, wow, he is going to be a very powerful demonstration. So I invited him up and we did the process. And then it was after breakthrough that he sent me an email And the email went something like this. It was kind of like, I don't know what you did or I don't know what I did or I don't know what we did, but wow, that was incredible. I have since breakthrough, I now only have two coffees. So you're still having coffee, but it reduced quite dramatically. And I, he then said, I so want to come to breakthrough again And this time I'm really clear on my why and I'm bringing my wife with me as well. And I said, fantastic. Can I ask a favor? And I said to him, a lot of people think that I set this up and uh, it would be fantastic if when you come to breakthrough, you could share your experience. And he said, I'm happy to do that. So I said, when, when we come to, you know, do the technique again, could you be okay to share your experience you know, after we do the technique with, with a new volunteer. And he said, sure. So when it came to do that, he then said, I, he, he recounted the email that he sent to me, but he then said, I now no longer drink coffee at all. I just don't drink it anymore. So it's a good demonstration of how we can actually change. So what I'd like to do, in, and I love this uh, particular testimonial. He, he found that he loved NLP and learning NLP so much that he encouraged his entire family to come into our program. And all of them came into the program bar his oldest son. And he invited me to dinner one night and he said, please, I'm going to sit you next to my oldest son. And because I really want him to do the program. Um, as it turned out, they all did the program and they all went off and did incredible things. So I was going to do a chat, but what I want to now cover into is how did you become you? So how did you become you and how can you change if you really want to? So I'm going to give this to you from a very simplistic perspective, but shortly, of course, I'm going to be asking for a volunteer. So I'm going to be asking for someone who wants to stop eating or drinking a particular food or drink that you love, but you can't stop enjoying it. And I'm going to show you how you can shift for good. So the first thing that I want to say is it comes with a warning. You must accept that you'll no longer like or love it again. So, you know, don't come to me asking for change if you really want to keep doing that particular behavior. So one of you will already go, yep, there's something that I want to give up. So when we get to that point, I'd like you, of course, to volunteer. So let's go to how we become who we become. So up to seven, our brain is mostly in alpha. And I'll talk about alpha a little bit later into the training. But alpha essentially is when our hertz rating is about sort of between 8 and 12 hertz. It's very slow. It's usually the, the state that we have to get into before we fall asleep. If we cannot get to alpha, it is actually really hard to get to sleep. So what we see, hear, and feel in our first seven years at the end of the day largely becomes us. It becomes our programming. Our brain at the end of the day is nothing more than a tool. It is just like a computer. You know, we can put software into it. We can upgrade it. We can shift it. We can change it. We can make it do more by upgrading it. So that quote came from Dr. Morris Massey. So when we think of our senses, our senses essentially, words that we hear, sounds that we hear, Of course, we know that our ears are very close to our brain. So 
you know, sound, what you're hearing right now, you have turned it all into meaning. You have turned it all into words. And all those words have meaning. But if you think about what sound really is, it's a vibration. And that vibration hits certain areas within our ear and it sends a particular frequency and a series of frequencies and signals into our brain and our brain then interprets those frequencies and signals. But over time, we learn to associate certain words to mean certain things. Like, can you remember as a child learning a power word? And that power word was no. And when you learned that power word, typically what infuriated parents was the fact that when you repeated it to your parents and said no. So you learned that as a power word, no. Yes or no determines what you will and won't experience. It's basically the beginning of our belief system if we think about it. So, of course, what you smell. Now, again, smells are just smells. Smells are frequency. The frequency that we smell is basically it, it is the elements that go through the air and they hit those small hairs in our noses and those small hairs send the signal to our brain that says that that smell is good or bad. Good or bad is just the definition you've given it. You know, they are just smells, but we call them good, we call them bad. Then again, our eyes, again, these senses are very close to the brain. Our eyes essentially determine light. Light is just a frequency. That light then determines colours, shapes, form, shadow, dark, light, and that determines how we experience things. So just these three senses make a big, big difference to our world. Of course, we have another sense, you know, which many of those senses are on our tongues. So we have these cavities on our tongues. And of course, these cavities equally take in data, translate the data into sweet, sour, you know, uh, uh, savory, etc. And these particular feelings, ideas, concepts go again into our brain. So again, our tongue is very close to our brain. Now, further away from our brain is the elements of touch. Now, um, what we have is basically every single hair on our body, every single dimple, our entire skin is an ear. So our skin feels, and of course, we've got an incredible amount of nerves that run through our, just underneath our skin, connecting again to our neurology. So feelings, we determine what is wet, what is warm, what is cold, what is hot, what is nice, what is bad, all of this through our senses. And then, of course, the one sense, and this is the sense that not a lot of us agree on as being a sense. Personally, I do believe it's a sense, but we might call this sense intuition. We might call this sense our heart. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be learning from something that I learned many years ago, which is integrating your three brains. And we do have three. We have a head brain. We have a heart brain and we have a gut brain. And tomorrow I'm going to show you how to synchronize these three brains so that you can get what you really want in life. So you are completely uh, allowing your autonomic nervous system to be balanced and in sync so that you start doing the behaviors that help you to achieve what you want in your life. So I'm calling that the sixth sense, intuition or heart. So when we look at these, our senses essentially lock in our identity. And I'm going to explain a little bit how this works. So for example, in the context of when you first discovered a very special feeling, and that very special feeling was when you were picked up as a child. 
So when you were picked up as a child by your mother, father, or other, you know, uncles, aunts, you know, people that brought you close to that last sense that I was talking about, the heart, that what you were getting was you were getting a vibration or a frequency that was that was signaling to your own heart because usually when you pick up a child, you bring chest to chest and you will hug that child. Now, if you think about hugs, why do we love hugs so much? It's because many of those hugs meant so much to us as we were growing up. But there were other meaning that became associated, you know, when this happened. So when you felt the feeling of being picked up, what you created in your mind is you decided that up was good. So most of us want to be up. We all like it when our business figures go up. We all like being up in our emotional state. Up is good as far as we are concerned. So we decided that up is actually a good thing. So when we count numbers, like if we go one, two, three, four, five, six, the more numbers, the better, because we're going up in numbers. In hypnosis, quite often, we will talk to someone and say to them, we're going to count from 10 going down. Now, 10 going down usually means that we are going down, but also it can actually mean to some people that down is bad, you know, such as when you place the child down, they were usually placed down because maybe they did something that was wrong. Maybe they pulled your hair. Maybe they poked you in the eye. Maybe you did something that hurt mum or dad, and so they then put you down. But they also learnt from how you put them down. You know, what was the tonality that you used? What did you say? And so we have created this connotation of up is good, down is bad. And so this, at the end of the day, becomes this, this moderates much of our behavior. This determines how we see the world. So what you heard gave you words and sounds that you turned into facts, including tonality, which told you how people sound when they feel good and how they sound when they feel bad. And then what they do when they feel that way. So there are many words that we hear that are in, in our perspective, they might sound good to someone else, but they might sound bad to us. These form what we know in neurolinguistic programming as metaprograms. So these form many of the filters that we build in our brain that determine what is good or what is bad. Equally, some things you saw couldn't be unseen. So again, you turned those into facts, you know, things that you actually saw. So you now believe what you can see with your own two eyes. You know, we believe, and you've heard the saying, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, the opposite is true. You'll believe it when you can see it, you know, in your mind's eye. Now, here's a quick little tip. If there's something that is not happening in your life that you really want to happen, a lot of it is due to the picture that you have of it in your brain. You know, you might be thinking that, you know, when you want something to happen, there is a distance to it. Let me give you another example of this. The things that you can see when you close your eyes and the things that you can see when you are not in the picture like you can see the thing that you want in front of you, you are more likely to have that. If you can close your eyes and when you close your eyes, you actually see yourself in the picture away from the thing that you really want, is you're less likely to manifest that thing into your life. Because in your mind, there is distance between you and it. Languaging does this big time. So when we say, I want, I need, we are really saying I don't have. When we say I am, we say we are that. We are that right now. 
So the unconscious mind doesn't know time. It doesn't know distance. So it's either believing 100% you are something or you are not something. It is very black and white. I am or I'm not. So equally, what you smelled gave you words to describe your good and bad experiences. You even gave Stinky his name because he couldn't control his lower gastrointestinal tract. You know, so we created a lot of ideas around what is good and what is bad. You know, kids, for example, what happens quite often is our nose is so close to our mouth and it's there for good reason. So if we, you know, as a child, if you are being fed something that doesn't smell good, you know, by your definition, you will not eat that thing because it doesn't smell good, therefore it isn't good, and so therefore you won't have it. Um, you know, durian, of course, defies this. You know, in fact, durian over in Asia is considered to be, you know, a, a food, even though it, it tastes like custard and it's really delicious to have by some people's, you know, um, nose, it is something that a lot of people think, you know, you're, you're quite brave at having it because it doesn't smell so good. You know, durian smells a little bit like dirty socks. So the thing is that equally taste, when you first tasted ice cream, you actually activated your TAS1R2 or 1R3 protein, and that determined what that taste actually is you know but your joy of sugar has more to do with making you feel good which is interesting you know a lot of people have come to really enjoy sugar but if you think about it a lot of that happened when you were conditioned at a very very young age typically we were given sweet things when we were good ice creams, lollies, lots of sugar products. So what a lot of people will do with that information, with that data, is one thing uh, we saw from a coaching perspective during lockdown and, and after lockdowns, we had a lot of people coming to us saying, oh, my God, uh, my self-esteem is low, I feel anxious, I feel uncertain, a lot of people came to us because they wanted help with weight. A lot of people had put on a lot of weight during lockdowns. And the reason for that was very much because of this. A lot of us associated sweet things or perhaps foods that we might not want to have in oversupply. And that is because we felt so low, we wanted to feel up. We wanted to feel good again. So what a lot of people did is they had cravings. They started eating a lot of sweet foods and in abundance because they were at home in lockdowns on their own. So it's basically sugar comes because it makes us feel good. So when we feel bad, we often go to things that make us feel good. So here is the one that I find most people deny, the sense that most people deny. It's the sixth sense. You know, strangely, it's a sense that will, in fact, give us the most joy. It's the one that people listen to least. Um, over the years, I've had a lot of people who come to me and they say, Rick, this is an area of my life that isn't really working. And I'll say to them, okay, so why do you want to make this work? Is it for you or is it for someone else? And a lot of people will make decisions in their lives really aiming to please other people rather than pleasing themselves. And the reason they're doing that is because they're going to their head more than to their heart. So I'll often say to a client, I'll say, why do you want this thing to happen? Why is the big question? You know, it's a very important question to ask. Your why will drive you. Your why is where your motivation is. 
So I'll ask them, why do you want this? And, you know, like someone might say to me, I want to increase my income. And I'll say, why do you want to increase your income? You know, why? And they will say things such as, you know, I've got to do this or I've got to achieve that. And when you hear people saying I've got to, it usually sounds like the direction is coming from someone else. It's not actually coming from themselves or I have to or I must or I need to. If we keep following our musts, our have tos, our needs to, our, our got tos, we're going to start living a life that isn't truly ours. We're actually going to be living a life for somebody else. So the question that I often ask is I ask, what does your heart say about this? And we'll be talking more about this tomorrow. What does your heart say about this? Now, all your values, they're found in your heart. All the things that you truly, truly, truly want at a very deep level are all found in your heart brain. The, your head brain, yes, that's your strategy. That's how you fulfill your heart. But this is the part of you that will make you happy. If you follow your heart more than your head, you will find that you will be a much, much happier person. Um, let me give you an idea of this. When I first started down this path, you know, I was very successful in my first year of coaching. I started doing things like breakthroughs. I was teaching lots of people lots of things. And, you know, a lot of people said, oh, Rich Schnabel is the new Tony Robbins. You know, he's so successful. He's, you know, you're going to end up with a Learjet. You're going to, you know, have a massive house. You're going to be, you know, driving all these amazing cars. And a lot of people projected their vision of success on me. And I must admit, my ego bought it. And I must also say, that I was the unhappiest at that part of my life than at any part of my life. Sure, I was making a lot of money. I was doing really, really well. You know, I had a lot of things, but I was very unhappy. The reason is because I was following other people's dreams. I was the pinup boy for their dreams. And I began to realize that pff, I don't want to lead yet. Um, I don't want a prestige car. In fact, I don't drive prestige cars. I don't want a lot of money. You know, I've got everything that I really want in my life. I really do. So materialism is, is not the ultimate aim in, in my life, but I know other people certainly want a lot more in a financial sense. And you can have that, but you've got to go to your heart. So it is really, really important to listen to that particular part of you most. So my next question to you is this. What would make you believe in aliens mostly? Like, now, I'm not saying they exist. I'm not saying they don't exist. And it's a little bit like theology or faith. I'm never, ever going to tell you whether there is a God or isn't a God or there's a Buddha or there's a, you know, any sort of theological concept or idea. I'm never going to tell you that because that is your own faith, you know. But the question is, what would make you believe in aliens mostly? What I mean by that, would you have to see them? Would you have to smell them? Would you have to taste them or eat with them or hear them? or feel them, or intuit them? What would be the most convincing? So what I'd like you to do is just pop in the chat what you would think would be the way that you would believe aliens exist. What would be the number one? Would you have to see them, smell them, taste them, hear them, feel them, or intuit them? So go ahead and put in the chat what you think would make you believe in aliens. If aliens appeared in front of you, if aliens came to your house, so I've got uh, C, so far, sight, C, intuition, C and intuition. Okay, so the majority are C. So 
your your sight, your vision is typically the part that you trust most. So it's the thing that you trust mostly. Some people need to hear it. You know, I don't believe it until I hear it myself. Some people need to see it, but I would argue that most people want to see things with their own eyes. So that tells you that your sight is really powerful. That also tells you what is your number one manifesting tool in your life. So here is what I'm going to give you up front. If you want to create something in your life, you need to do two things. I mentioned the thing alpha earlier, you know, alpha, and I'll talk a bit more about that as we get further into breakthrough, but alpha is where your brain waves tend to relax. So you get gamma. Gamma is when you're in a heightened state. And then beta is when you're probably in the state that you're in. You're either in, in one of these three states. You're either going to be in gamma right now, beta, or you're going to be in alpha. Alpha is when you're more relaxed. Alpha is when you're pretty chilled. And alpha is often when you meditate or you're under hypnosis or you are just chilling back. In fact, you're going to alpha really quickly watching television. So do be very selective what you watch because in alpha, that is when your brain is in a very receptive state. So in other words, you can use alpha really easily, really well to get yourself in a very receptive state. And if sight is your number one sense that makes you believe what you really want to believe, then just before you go to bed, and this is a little ritual that I do very regularly, I imagine what I want tomorrow. What do I really want tomorrow? Like, I'll give you an example. You know, Let's say tomorrow I'm coaching somebody and let's say it's a really big challenge and I'm thinking to myself, how do I get them to where they need to be? You know, they've told me where they want to go and they're not getting there. So how am I going to get them there? So I will imagine, you know, let's say tomorrow I'm coaching them. So tonight I will just before I go to sleep, I will put them in my mind I will see them in my coaching call and I do all my coaching calls on Zoom so I can see them in front of me and I'm looking through my own eyes. So I'm looking at my computer screen. I can see their face on Zoom and I see them smiling and I see them going, wow, wow. So I can hear them as well and I can feel the feeling that we have gotten them there. They are in exactly the space that they need to be in. They've had the big epiphany. They have shifted. So what I've actually used in that moment is I have used my sight to originate that thought. I'm in alpha, so I'm very relaxed. So I'm able to receive. I'm able to, I'm very receptive. And then I have also used hearing so I've used sound so I can hear them saying, wow, I'm there, awesome, fantastic. And, they, and I can feel it and I can feel it. And also my heart, I can feel it in my heart and my intuition, my, my sixth sense is fully engaged in the experience. So that's a great way to begin to start shifting your thinking. Very simply, anybody can do this. You know, you, you don't have to be an NLP master to do just what I've shared with you. It certainly comes from NLP, but you do not have to be an NLP master to actually do that yourself. You can actually do it very easily. So just going through the steps, very simply, choose really what you want from life. Before you go to sleep, when your brain relaxes or during the day, just meditate or get yourself into a very relaxed sense, begin to see what you want to see. And then at the end of it, see it exactly as you want to see it and feel it, hear it, perhaps even smell it. If you could imagine what it would smell like, perhaps what your mouth would taste like as you are looking at it. And then what your heart ultimately 
would know that you have achieved it. So that's a very, very quick technique that anybody can do. So in a sense, basically, what we're coming to understand is that our senses literally determine where we're going. Now, according to Stephen Covey, he said the way that we see things is the source of the way we think or the way that we act. It's the way that we see things determines what we think and determines what we act. Now, I think he got it pretty well right, but it's deeper than that. It's a little bit more than that because what happens is we get an event, we have an experience. This event comes into our senses and according to Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, who was a, the author of a book called Flow, he said that at any given second, there are 2 million bits of information coming into our senses. Now, our language filter, you know, the moment I say, Saya mal nasi gorang, if you don't know Indonesian, you don't know that I just said I want fried rice. So that's our language filter. So our language filter was very much what we were talking about earlier. It's the words that we use to talk about our experience. And that then locked in our attitudes around those words. And those attitudes that determine what that memory was actually like. Was it good? Was it bad? And that memory starts to build and form beliefs that we have about how the world is, how our world is. And those come to determine our values, what's really important to us and what's not important to us. And in fact, our values is our biggest deletion system. In other words, what we don't value, we actually do not even see. We do not even hear we do not even experience, even though it's happening. So that forms our meta programs. Our meta programs are the sorts of filters that determine are we people people or are we project people? Are we big picture thinkers or are we detail thinkers? Are we very much about experiences or are we about things? Are we about um, enjoying our life based upon how we feel or are we enjoying our lives based upon how we think? So they are some of our meta programs. And then, of course, we make decisions in a nanosecond. So we get this event that comes into our experience and through these filters, we determine what this event is. And we delete 2 million bits of information down 7 plus or minus 2 bits per second. Now, when I first saw this, when I was learning neurolinguistic programming, because this is a model that we use in our NLP practitioner training, you know, a very first level training. Basically, what I got is I got that this creates an exciting opportunity. So, for example, there are opportunities everywhere. There really are. But if we just look at one of those filters, like our beliefs filter, what that will say is what we can experience in our opportunity and what we can't. Like, for example, when I first went into NLP, I was struggling financially. You know, I, I went up and down a roller coaster financially. And I wanted to, when I went into the NLP practitioner training, I wanted to change how I thought about money and I wanted to increase my income. So I went in with a very, very specific why. And so everything I learned was all about increasing my income. So I went, you know, down from a paltry income to literally earning millions of dollars. And it happened because of this, because I sat back and thought to myself, what am I not seeing? Like if I'm deleting or generalizing or distorting information from 2 million bits every second down to just seven or nine, 
or five bits of information, there are literally, you know, over a million things that I can't see. There are over a million things I can't hear. So I began to think to myself, what am I missing out on? What am I not hearing? What am I not seeing? Because essentially all of those filters determine an internal representation. So we see an event and we say, oh, this is what it is. And then what happens is we create an emotional state, a feeling in our body. And then what we do is that feeling goes directly into our physiology, into our bodies, and then that becomes our behavior. So I thought to myself, what if I could change the content of some of these filters? What if I could use NLP to change and improve my language? What if I could shift my attitude? What if I could change my memories, improve some of my beliefs and get rid of some beliefs that don't serve me, reshuffle my values, go into my meta programs and understand how I'm thinking and why I'm thinking, and then make new decisions. This was a game changer for me. So my world changed dramatically. Um, now, by the way, um, you'll also notice that at the top right, and I just want to remind you of this, if you're following along on page nine is where I refer to this. And you might see that we've included the blank spaces. You know, so that's where all of this data is and you can put them in your manual. That's if you want to experience breakthrough in that particular way. So basically these perceptual filters of the mind, what they do tell us is they do tell us that we can change, we can shift, we can move. And so once we work out and realize that we can shift, we can change, we can move, then the question is why do we want to move and where do we want to go? What do we want to create as a result in our lives? So basically, when we consider this here, what we're literally doing is we become the sum total of all of these filters, you know, like all of these filters determine the sum total of who we are. So who you think you are comes down to your language. It's not just the words that exist in your language. It's the tonality of that language too. It's how you say them. You know, so some people kind of talk in a particular way and they say, well, that's who I am. I'm this person. And then there are other people that speak in another way. And because of the way that they speak is that's how they believe they are. Now, I'm not creating any distinctions between one being good or one being bad, but it's not just our language. It's actually how we speak that determines who we are. It's definitely our attitudes, you know, and our attitudes can flip from one to another based on the environment that we place ourselves in. In some environments, we have a really good attitude. In some environments, we don't have a good attitude according to others. Our memories, you know, everything that we have become has literally come from many of the experiences which we now call memories. And our beliefs determine our on or off buttons. If you don't believe something's possible, it will never, ever happen for you. If you believe that it is possible, it will happen for you. Now, I had a, a, a master's group uh, that I was teaching last week, and I shared something about myself that I don't share to a lot of people. And I said to the group, I said, one of the things that really opened up my beliefs was that when I was a kid, I saw ghosts. You know, I, I literally saw entities that came into my bedroom as a child. It scared the crap out of me. You know, it really did. But later in my life, I began to ask the question, why did I see ghosts? And why did many of my friends not see ghosts? Why did they think I was a lunatic? Because I saw those ghosts. And, you know, the... The recipe for that is that it just didn't meet their belief system, whereas it met mine. But something else happened. The reason I saw ghosts is because I was able to get my brain into a higher level frequency that could actually see entities, just like a medium or a clairvoyant 
can shift their frequency to be able to perhaps see the future. But that depends on whether you believe or you don't believe. So our meta programs, which I've discussed at a bit of length, determine our experience and our values. That is what is important to you is what you will do mostly. So if you have a problem in any area of your life, it will actually come down to how much value you have in those areas of your life. And what are the values? What are the things that you value most? Like, for example, if someone has challenge in their weight, for example, you know, let's say you want to, you feel like you want to put on weight or you want to, or you want to lose weight. Well, that will come down to your values. And for example, some people value food in different ways. Some people believe food is just something that you have that keeps you going. Some people believe that food is what you have to reward yourself. And the two people will have a completely different experience with food. So that comes down to your values. And of course, your decisions are the things that actually define you, the things that you do. Your decisions, of course, have actions usually associated with them, and they will be the things that you actually do. And they will determine how you show up, you know. So basically, these form your identity. And your identity is the most powerful thing in your life. Who you think you are is who you will become. So, for example, when we think about that, when we go to Dr. Morris Massey, who said that, you know, from ages zero to seven, we're not even conscious. So we're completely ruled by our unconscious. So at the end of the day, that's children. But what's our excuse? You know, when as adults, we find that we have essentially, whenever we face difficulty, that, you know, our neural programs essentially create the same behaviours. The software that we was installed when we were children basically becomes the same software that still runs us as adults. So if we're facing difficulty, the answer is go back to the software, upgrade, change. So, you know, like in this example, his parents told him not to trust strangers. And you're in the audience and you're looking at this poor guy and he's freaking out. He cannot control his behavior. He wants to. He wants to be a good speaker. He wants to be able to, you know, put that microphone under his mouth and start sharing his wisdom with the world. But he can't. And the reason that he can't, it's from the fact that his parents told him not to trust strangers. Now, as an adult, his boss told him that he must go on a stage and speak to strangers. This is where a lot of our programming trips us up. It's because it's old programming. It's the programming that we trusted, just like the trust that you have that you can get up, get on your feet and walk. Now, that's a program you don't want to change unless you want to dance, unless you want to now run, unless you now want to walk in a different way. So in other words, there are some programs that we can completely trust that are old. You know, the program that you use to feed yourself, you know, perhaps that has worked really well and up until you start eating socially and people say, why don't you use a knife and fork? And, you know, maybe you were never taught to use a knife and fork, you know, but in social environments, people expect you to use knives and forks. So senses at the end of the day make sense of our world. Now, the truth is, the great thing is, you now have a formula to make you. So if you now know the formula to make you, you can also use that same formula to change you. So when we hear from Gerald Zaltman, he's a Harvard professor, he said that 95% of thought, emotion, and learning occur in the unconscious mind. That is without our awareness. We're not even aware 
of our thoughts most of the time, which is called metacognition. We're not aware of the thinking that creates the behaviours. And so, therefore, we know that we have a conscious mind. We know we have a subconscious mind. It's underneath or below the conscious mind. But we also have the unconscious mind, and that is where 95% of our thinking originates. In fact, 95% of our behaviour originates in the unconscious. So to change, we're going to have to go very deep into the unconscious. And I want to share exactly how you do that. So now it's time. I'd really like to have one volunteer. Now, this volunteer, I want someone who wants to stop eating or drinking something, you know, but the truth is they want to stop this behavior. You know, they don't want to eat or drink that thing again. Again, you must accept that after volunteering and after doing this process that you're not going to love or like that food or drink again. So what I'm really looking for is a volunteer, and then we're going to go to some questions afterward. So what I'm looking for is someone who actually, and I'm just going to change the view, so we go to gallery view, and I just want to get someone who actually wants to change a food or a drink. You know, anyone that wants to stop drinking like coffee or tea or Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Um, by the way, if you're drinking anything that's got a spa time, that could be a damn good thing to stop drinking because that is so poisonous. So, and there I go, I said it publicly. So the thing is, is there a drink? Is there a food that you want to get rid of? So who would like to get rid of something? So just... Um, now, if you're putting, I'll volunteer. Now, Rachel said that she will volunteer. So, Rachel, what I'd like to know is what is the food or drink that you would want to get rid of? So, what is the food or drink? Alcohol. Okay, cool. So, what specific alcohol is the alcohol that you want to get rid of? Now, why I say what specific alcohol, it's because of this reason. We want your brain to be able to specifically see the alcohol that you want to get rid of. So you've got to be very specific. So it's got to be a particular drink, you know, like a beer, we can see. A wine, it's got to be red or white. But here's what your brain will probably do. You will not, let's say if you decide to get rid of red wine, you will not drink red wine you will find it very difficult to drink red wine. But you may well go to white wine from now on. So if you want to get rid of alcohol specifically, you're going to have to go through the whole groups. You're going to go, have to go through the whites. You're going to have to go through the reds, the browns, you know, and the clears and all of those particular drinks and the greens and all of that. So uh, sugary alcohol drinks, okay, so that's what you want to get rid of. So what I want you to uh, give me is what specific sugary alcohol drink do you want to stop? Is there a particular one that you're drinking a lot? So is there a particular one? Is it a particular color? So maybe put the specific drink and the color of it. That would be helpful. So Mike's Strawberry Hard Lemonade. Okay, cool. So I don't even know what that looks like, but um, I'm just going to hope that you do, which no doubt you do. So um, now, Rachel, um, I'm going to ask you another question. Do you really want to give it up? And that requires a distinct yes or no. Do you really want to give it up? That's a yes. Okay, cool. So now the next question I'm going to ask you, which is the most important question, why? Why do you want to stop drinking that particular drink? You know, why? What's the reason that you want to stop drinking that particular drink? And that's asking you to think of an outcome. That's asking you to think about, you know, the specific reason you want to give it up. And that also gives you a sense of what outcome are you aiming to achieve? 
for my health and my heart. Awesome. Okay, so you want to be healthier by getting rid of these to stop drinking these. Now I'm going to ask you one more question. Awesome. The next question I'm going to ask you is this. I'm going to ask you from 1 to 10. 10 meaning you totally want to give this up. 1 meaning you don't really want to give it up. So what would be the number that you would want to give it up? A 10. Awesome. Now, the first thing that I'll say is that you never, ever want to do this process with someone who gives you something that's probably lower than five because they're not really going to put in the effort. So what I'm going to do is, um, Rachel, are you okay? Do you have a camera? Are you okay to, um, you know, show up just so we can work with you specifically or are you happy to do this without camera? So I'm happy to do this either way. I know some people don't like cameras and that's okay. Personally, I'm pretty okay with cameras. So what do you want to do? Do you want to do camera or no camera or do you one second? Okay, cool. So you're just getting your camera ready. And so what we're going to do is we know that you want to give this up as a 10. So as you're getting your camera all ready, okay, thank you, Rachel. So as you're getting yourself all ready, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to think about a number as to how much you desire Mike's Strawberry Hard Lemonade. So 10 is you totally love it. Zero is you don't. Um, nine. Nine? Okay, cool. Fantastic. Awesome. So what I'm going to get you to do is in a moment, I'm going to get you to, um, can you, uh, is it okay for you? I, I, I get that you're holding a, a phone at the moment. So can you rest the phone somewhere? Because I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a moment. Can you do that? Um, yeah, give me one second. I'll figure okay. something out. Okay, cool. Okay, while you're figuring that out, Rachel, um, we did a weather report when we all started. You know, where were we and, and what was the temperature? So where are you at the moment, Rachel, Ge geography-wise? Okay, it sounds like Rachel's getting a stand or something like that. So as Rachel's getting a stand, feel free. Does anyone have any questions based on what we've covered so far? So does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for Rachel to get her phone set up? Hey, Ray. Yes. Connie, look, I was going to volunteer and then I'm having difficulty. I don't really want to give up those things. And that was very interesting to me. Like they're some of my favorite things. I'd like, to, I need to moderate them more than give them up. Do you do moderation as well? You can, um, but, but let me give you an example of this. Um, I once had a cocaine dealer who came to me and he said, I want to stop using my own product. And, and I said, okay, so you, you want to completely stop it? And he said, actually, no. I just want to have a little bit of my product. And I said, but is that really good for you? Is it really good for your health? And he said, uh, no, but I don't care. And uh, so, yes, you can back it off. You can back it off. But typically it works really, really well when you don't have to back it off at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, but very good question. But what you, what you got a sense of there is that you really don't want to give it up. You know, so yeah, yeah, not ready. Yet. Yeah, and it's nothing bad for me. It's just the moderation bit. But yeah, yeah. but anyway, I think Rachel's got a camera going. Thanks for that, though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you are most most welcome. So welcome to breakthrough too. So Rachel, what I'm going to get you to do is, in a moment, I'm going to get you to close your eyes. Now, all you're going to have to do is how this works is I'm going to get you to think about when you think of the Mike Strawberry Hard Lemonade. I'm going to get you to create a picture of that in your mind's eye. So, so what I'm going to get you to do is just close your eyes now 
and let the first picture that springs to mind come up when you think of Mike's Strawberry Hard Lemonade. Have you got a picture? Yeah. Okay, cool. So is the picture black and white or colour? Colour. Okay. Is the picture near or far away from you? Near. Okay. If you could give me a sense of how close it is to you. Um, right in front of me. Like right in front, is it kind of like a, just a few centimetres away or an inch away or? Uh, three inches. About three inches away. Okay. So tell me, uh, give me a sense of the size of the picture. Um, I don't know, small. Yeah, so small yeah. as? Uh, maybe five inches tall. Okay, so about five inches tall. How, how wide would it be? Uh, three inches. Okay, so five by three. Okay, so it's five by three. It's about three inches away from you. It's, it's colour. Yep. And is this picture landscape or panoramic? Like you can, you can see it through your whole consciousness or is it framed? Framed. Okay, so it's framed. And this picture, is it a movie or still? Still. It's still. Okay. So where do you feel it in your body? As you look at this picture, what's the first awareness you get? Where in your body do you feel it? Um, I don't know. Okay. What do you mean? You, you'll get a sense of when you look at this picture, you will get a sensation somewhere in your body. So I want you to go searching for that sensation in your body. Where do you feel it in your body when you look at this picture? Um. Just in my mind, I guess. Yeah, so where in your mind do you feel this picture? Um, like at the front or the back of your mind or the sides? The front. The front of your mind. Okay, so this particular feeling at the front of your mind, how big or how little is it? Um, I guess like average. Okay, what do you mean average? So, like medium. So medium, how big or how little would you scale medium? Um, like the exact size. Okay, so, or... it's the, so it's a realistic size. Like it's the, it, so this particular drink, does it come in a can or a bottle or? A bottle. Okay, so it's about the size of the bottle, yeah? Yeah, yep. Okay, so I want you to get a sense of this feeling you know, as you look at this picture and tell me, is this feeling, does it feel like it's heavy or light? Um, maybe a little more to the heavy side. Okay. So if you had to weigh it, what would you, what would you suggest it weighed? A little under a pound. Okay. So just under a pound. And this particular feeling, is, a, is it pulsing or is it steady? Steady. So it's steady. Okay. So this particular feeling, does it have any sounds that are associated with this feeling? Like no. can you, you can't hear anything? No. So there's no sounds that are associated with this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So when you rate it right now as to how much you love this drink, what number would you give it now? Maybe a seven. So a seven. It's dropped a little bit. Okay. What I'm going to get you to do is open up your eyes and come back to us for a moment. Okay. So what you've done is you've, you've essentially given us what is called the submodalities of that particular picture that you have and all your associations. So this these are your neurological associations with this drink. So this particular drink, um, can you tell me what color is the actual drink? It's like a pinkish red. Okay, so it's a pinkish red. So I want you to think of something that is a liquid that is pinkish red, but you would never, ever, 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 ever drink it. Okay. Okay. I got something. Okay. Can you tell us what that something is? Yeah, cough medicine. 
Okay, cough medicine. Now, my question is, if I paid you a million dollars, would you have that cough medicine? I mean, I would maybe take a sip of it. I wouldn't drink like the whole bottle. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's choose something else. So I want you to choose something that you would never even put close to your lips. Okay. Hmm. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, there are some, um, there, there's some petrol or, you know, gas products, you know, that, okay, yeah, that, yep. that are kind of red in that same color. Yeah. 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 Okay. Would you drink, you no. know, you wouldn't drink gasoline or petrol? No? no. No. Okay. Cool. So what I'm going to get you to do is do exactly the same thing. And I'm going to get you to get a picture of that uh, product, that gasoline or petrol. Okay. Okay. So tell me, that particular picture, close your eyes now. And I want you to tell me, what is the first picture that springs to mind when you see that gasoline, that petrol? A gasoline jug. So it's a gasoline jug. Okay, yeah. so this particular picture, is that colour or black and white? Colour. Okay. Is it near or far away from you? Um, about the same distance. Okay, so it's the same distance. And this particular picture, uh, is it, what size is the picture itself? Um, about an 8 by 10. So eight by 10 inches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this particular picture, is it panoramic or is it framed? Framed. Is it moving or still? Still. And this particular picture, is it, um, so it's, it's quite still, but is it three-dimensional or flat? Flat. And where do you feel this picture in your body now? Um, kind of like in my stomach area. Yeah. And what is the size of this feeling? Um, like the size of my whole stomach. So it's your whole stomach. Yeah. Okay. And... Tell me this particular feeling, what shape is it? Square. If you could just square. So square as in cubed? Yeah. Okay. And this particular feeling, is it pulsing or is it steady? Steady. And are there any sounds that you can hear at all as you look at this picture and feel this feeling? No. Okay. What are you saying in your head about the thought of drinking this? Um, I don't like that and I don't want to do that. Yeah. So you're saying I don't like that, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to get you to do is ask you, can you smell popcorn right now? If I try. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. So opening your eyes. So what I'm going to get you to do now is I want you to, I want you now to close your eyes. And for the last time, now what we're going to do is get that original picture back. Have you got it back? Yep. Okay. Now what I want you to do is I want you to make it bigger. So it was okay. about three by five before. So I want you to now make it eight by 10. So make it bigger. Okay. Okay. It's bigger now. Yep. Okay. So what I want you to do is it is framed. It is a still and it's flat. Yep. Okay. So what I want you to do is as you do that, I want you to now smell the gasoline. 
So just smell as if you could, if it was in a glass and it was close to your nose, I want you to smell that gasoline. Just smell it. You don't have to bring it too close to your nose, but you can just smell it. Now what I want you to get a sense of is where do you now feel it in your body? Um, kind of my throat. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to let it go down even further. So let it go down even further. Let it go down all the way to your stomach. So let it go down to your stomach. Okay, now you can start to feel that it's your whole stomach. You can now sense it in your whole stomach. So keep, yep. look, keep looking at the picture, smelling the gasoline, and now you can feel it in your whole stomach. And now what I want you to do is I want you to now notice that it's steady. It's a very steady feeling. Have you got that steady feeling? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, it's almost mimicking the previous feeling that you had just a moment ago. And now what I want you to do is I want you to say in your head, I don't want that. I don't like that. Just keep repeating that sentence as you see the picture and feel the feeling. I don't like that. I don't want that. And you can smell the gasoline at the same time. Just getting a sense. So I'm going to ask you, when you think of Mike Strawberry Hard Lemonade, when you think about it on a scale of zero to 10, 10 you love it, zero you don't, where would you be right now? What's the about first? About a six. About a six. So you've gone down from a nine to a seven to a six. So what I want you to do is I want you just to imagine, just for a moment, I want you to imagine you go to where you normally go to get this particular drink. So I want you to imagine, you can see it there, wherever you go to where you normally get this drink. And I want you to notice what happens now. What do you now see as a result as... You're now at the place where you normally get this drink. What is happening now? Um, I guess nothing really. I'm not as interested in getting it. Okay. So what are you doing instead? Getting something else. Exactly what we suggested might happen. So you're getting something else. What are you getting instead? Uh, water. Excellent. That's a good something else. So what I want you to do is I want you now to go out about a year from now. You've been doing this for a whole year. You know, you've completely dropped the Mike Strawberry Hard Lemonade. And you are now drinking a lot more water. Now, water is a fantastic thing, particularly if the water is quite well filtered. It means that it flushes your body. And water is fantastic. It builds up your corpus callosum, which is that connector between your right hemisphere of your brain and your left hemisphere of your brain. In other words, water is part of the reason that you can unlock your genius. If you can lubricate your body sufficiently, you know, making sure you're drinking a lot of water, not only will you flush your system and take out all of the dead cells and clear them out, what you're also doing is you are also allowing your cor corpus callosum to begin to grow. In other words, you can jump from the left and the right hemispheres of your brain, which is true genius. So I want you to notice how you are feeling now a year from now. You have now changed yourself in such a wonderful and delightful way. You're feeling quite proud of yourself now. So just get a sense of yourself. What do you notice about yourself after doing this for a whole year? I feel better, healthier. You feel better and healthier. Okay, awesome. I want you to now go out two years from now. You've now been doing this for two years. So it's two years on from now. What do you now see as a result of doing just that? Um, 
my body looks better from not taking in all the sugary stuff. Awesome. So what you're beginning to realize is that time is not linear. Time, in fact, is fractal. It means it's in a spiral. It means that basically you can, rather than degenerate, like most people think in linear terms, the older you get, the sicker you get, the more falls apart. BS, rubbish. In fact, today, personally, I'm the healthiest, the fittest, and the strongest I've ever been. So you can age and you can get healthier. So I want to get a sense that you've been doing a lot of work on yourself. You've been drinking this water. You've been doing healthy routines. And in fact, you notice that it is now five years from now, maybe even six, six years from now, and you are beginning to notice that you are looking healthier, younger, more attractive, stronger, fitter, more resilient. I want you to begin to notice that because of this decision that you made, this decision has compounded through your life and it's doing really good things. I want you to begin to notice how good you feel about yourself, that you have been doing this now for six years. So tell me, what do you now get a sense of? Accomplishment. So if you can do this, imagine what else you could do. Because when you are determined, when you decide, when you make the adjustments and decide to do life in a powerful way, you can do anything, can't you? Yep. Awesome. This is the new Rachel Riggs. This is the Rachel that you've been waiting for. This is the Rachel that can take life by the hands and with your kind heart and your beautiful soul. You can do great things, can't you? I hope so. <laughs> awesome. But it all comes down to decisions, doesn't it? Yep. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring you back, just gently opening your eyes, coming back to the room. And now what I want to do is just ask you, what are you thinking or feeling as a result of that very weird process? Um. I feel like a little bit lighter, I guess you could say. Yep. Awesome. So you feel a little bit lighter. How do you kind of feel about Mike Strawberry Hard Lemonade? Um, I feel like I don't really like care as much. Like when I go to the store, I actually saw myself, you know, getting something different. Awesome. And so what you've done essentially is you've created a new idea in your mindset. So you've got a completely new idea, new picture, new concepts. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Now, can we all unmute and give Rachel a huge round of applause? So excellent. Good job. Fantastic. Excellent. So here's the deal, Rachel. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to email me and let me know how well you've done, okay? okay? After breakthrough, can you do that for me? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Awesome. So thank you so much for yeah, thank you. being our demonstration for today. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. So let me just go through a little bit of the, the structure that, that I was sharing there with Rachel. So firstly, thank you so much, Rachel, for volunteering and allowing us to go through that particular process. So basically, the, the elements of what we were doing is very much about what we were talking about. We're using the very senses in which we use to determine our life. The issue is we're not conscious of our senses and what they do, and we're not conscious of many of the decisions that we make, and we're not conscious of many of the beliefs that we accept we just simply accept them into consciousness and then goes into subconscious and down into our unconscious. Now, unconscious now, whenever we make these quick decisions, whenever we make these new beliefs, whenever we readjust our values and our meta programs and all of these things, what happens is we now accept them to be true. We just now accept them as parts of us. 
And we don't question our beliefs. We very rarely do because, after all, they're our beliefs. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're taking all this data in with our senses. So what I'm saying to you is now that you know this consciously, it's now opportunity to consciously start creating. So what I'm going to do is feel free. Are there any questions that anyone has about what we've covered so far? So are there any questions whatsoever? Does anyone have any questions? How did that work? What, what went on there? Or yes, Con, Con, yes so if you use like, you know, toxic things to get people to avert from something they want to give up, is there a risk that if they have that, that they will experience the toxicity as if what they learned about that product was, you know, will the body react to it as you as you described? Well, the thing is that there is always a risk that the body could react to it in a negative way. Yes, most definitely. But the question is, would, um, for example, Mike's Strawberry Hard Lemonade, would that turn into gasoline or petrol? And the answer is no, it wouldn't. You know, it wouldn't turn into that. But there is essentially, you know, what we've created with Rachel is we've created a visual picture and we all agree that our sight is one of the most powerful ones of our senses so typically we start from the sight perspective it's it's really easy to start with our prime or our our predominant focus so we come out with a sight then what we do is we associate to the sight all of the elements that connect to the sight so the old picture in Rachel's head is now a new picture with a whole new rung of associations. So Rachel, you know, will find it much, much easier now to see that product that she once had, knowing full well she wants to shift it, and then making a new decision. It'll, it'll make it so much easier to make a new decision. A lot of people have asked me, you know, will that also mean that Rachel, if she was to drink it a little bit along your question there, Connie, would she have, uh, you know, a very bad reaction to it? Well, the answer is that she won't go and spit it out and, you know, et cetera. It won't be that extreme as an experience. In fact, you know, even with people that I've done this particular process with, with things like smoking, it won't make them like that, nor will they become evangelists, you know, uh, knocking glasses out of people's hands and things like that. Um, it just really what it does is it kind of balances out our neurological system. It kind of takes us to a neutral point. So instead of having the desire that we once have, which we know we've created in our own imaginations and our own minds through our senses, it will change it. It, it will essentially change it. Now, if there's a lot of social elements, and alcohol is one of those things that typically we have a lot of social elements that happen around alcohol. You know, some people have a lot of fun with it, you know, and, and have a lot of memories of a lot of, lot of a lot of fun that they had. But of course, if you've got someone who has not fun, like a lot of really bad, horrible hangovers, they will start balancing that out with the fun that they had and the hangover. So if the hangovers are much worse in value than the fun that they had, they will make choices to go, no, nah, that's it, I'm not doing that anymore. But if conversely, if it's the other way around, if the fun they had is far greater still in their memory than the hangovers that they had, which again, over time becomes a memory, then they'll keep going to the alcohol because of all the associated feelings that they have essentially. But great question, Connie. Thank you very, very much. So what I'm going to do is I want to go a little bit deeper and a little bit further. So I'm going to go to uh, this next slide. So the question that I'm going to ask you now is, are you the boss of your own life? So that really, at the end of the day, depends upon what you do when life gets tough. So when life gets tough, and let's look at life as it has been, you know, for many, many people. 
And one of the reasons that we decided to do a breakthrough after not doing one for seven years is for many people, life has gotten very, very tough. We've got the war in the Ukraine, of course, you know, and that has unsettled, unnerved a lot of people. You know, we've had spiralling inflation, you know, affecting many, many people. We've had interest rate rises, you know, um, all around the world. You know, we've had, you know, people's assets begin to diminish or adjustments in real estate. And, of course, what happens is we've had couples, people, families at home where many of these stresses have started to come out in arguments, in conversations and so forth. So uh, we started getting so many more people coming to us for help. You know, I can't, I can't cope. I can't manage my thoughts as I once did. And my life is in a completely different way. Now, we started doing a huge amount of research because we had so much inquiry and we started to realise that what a lot of this has done is it's actually shifted, the base has shifted. If we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, essentially we know the very basal needs of food, water, shelter, you know, um, basically a lot of that has been in question for a lot of people, like the very first level let alone the top level, which is purpose. You know, why am I here? What am I doing? You know, so what we discovered is we discovered that a lot of this has come from our basal needs shifting. So when life gets tough, what do most people do? And this really determines our failure or our success you know, we're all going to have tough lives from time to time. We're all going to go up and down, everybody, me included. You know, even though I'm highly skilled and highly trained, I will have higher days and some lower days based on the days themselves, the evidence procedure that is happening. So when we think about that, this is in truth what most people do. Most people pretend that nothing is happening at all. And a good way to do that is shut off your senses. In other words, this symbolically, you know, people putting their head in the sand, what are they really saying? They're really saying the part of their body that has most of the senses, block it out. Just put it in the ground, put your head in the ground. So now a lot of us think that what happens in life you know, when we go on to the road of success, we get some skills and then it's a straight line. And all of a sudden, there we are. You know, that's exactly what success is. The big problem with this as a concept or this as an idea is it's completely untrue. Anyone who has gained any level of success anywhere in any part of their lives know that in truth, You know, we we take off, we build a lot of momentum. And I completely believe that if you really want to achieve something, do everything you can about it and you will build momentum and you will find that you will hit a runway and you you will take off pretty quickly if you build a lot of momentum, if you do a lot of things about it. So truth is, quite often what happens is we have forces that drive our success down at times, you know, and so we change our emotion, we change how we feel about it. And as a result of that, a lot of people will often quit. They'll often stop and they won't find the success that they really wanted because they quit. Now, anyone who's successful in any area of their life will tell you that this happened to them. But instead of quitting, they kept going. And, you know, of course, they recovered. And then they went down again. And then they, you know, for some people, they quit after usually three times, three things that stop them, three things that go down. Some people quit at the first, some people quit at the second, but most people quit at the third thing. And that's because our brain is designed to have what's called a three-time convincer. Most of us have a three-time convincer. So when something doesn't work 
for the first time, people who have a one-time convincer will go, no, that's not going to work. I'll do something else or I'll quit. Some people have a two-time convincer. So the second time they quit. Most people have a three-time convincer. Most successful people go beyond that third time. So the thing that happens is we start to realize that these things force us down. So these are the things that we really have to do the work on. We've got to be able to build ourselves to a degree that when we go down, we don't allow our entire lives to fall down. So we don't become meaning-making machines about why that happened and how we're so terrible or undeserving or unskilled, et cetera. So the question I'm going to ask you is what is the first thing you do when life gets tough? What's the very first thing that you do? Now, as I said, most people do this. They deny. They pretend it hasn't happened. Now, this, by the way, can sometimes be a strategy to ensure that you keep doing what you do. You know, in other words, pretend it hasn't happened and just keep going. So that can actually be a good thing. So that's what most people do. You know, they completely deny it and stop or completely deny it and continue. Now, some people do this next thing. They now go to look for the hug. They look for the sugary treat. They look for something to make them feel good. They go for the alcohol or they go from something to make them feel good again. And other people, what they will do is they will recognize that they're missing a skill. You know, there's a skill that they don't have, and then they'll go to training. They'll go to actually learn, you know, to be able to get beyond by building a new skill. And then other people, what they will do is they will go to a mentor, a coach, a counsellor, a therapist, uh, a trusted advisor, someone who they believe in that can actually help them to achieve. So essentially what usually most people do is either they do the first thing, a lot of people will do the second thing, fewer people will do the third thing, much less people will do the third thing. They'll go to build their skill. And even much less will go to the fourth thing, which is actually going to someone who has achieved already what you want to achieve and call them a mentor, or they'll get coaching to work out what they're not doing and help them with the neurology. And some people will go to an NLP practitioner or a master practitioner or a therapist or someone who is really quite skilled at working out what is the thinking that is causing the specific behavior. So the road to mastery, in my mind, is really about the result of adding and taking away. So in other words, what we're essentially doing is we are quite often, we are taking something away or adding. In this case, the very first thing to mastery is if the world is not showing up the way that you want it to show up, the first thing you've got to do is accept what is real. Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't deny it. Just go, okay, it's clearly not working. So what do I have to add? What do I have to accept about this situation? And now you're working with facts. Now you're working with something that is absolutely real. The next thing is we take away. We've now got to work out what belief system, what idea or decision that I'm making that's not working, what do I get rid of? So what should I release from my life is another way to frame it. So here we're asking, you know, why am I not getting the results and what do I actually have to detach from? Then the next thing that we need to do is what am I going to do next? So when am I going to do what it takes? This is a when question or a what question. So when am I going to make a decision to get what I really want in my life and what am I going to do? So 
Something that I learned in coaching in the very early years is that it's the questions that you're asking yourself that really determine whether you're getting success in your life or not. So it is really, really important to begin to know, have a system, have a structure. You know, if something's not working, what are you not accepting and what do you need to accept? What do you need to get out of your life? What do you need to detach from? You know, is it a belief? Is it a behavior that you're doing? Is it a group of people that you're working with that are pulling you down like a bucket of crabs? So what needs to come out of your life? Then what needs to come in? What do you need to decide upon? And then what do you need to do? And then typically, who knows how and where can I learn? So usually what we've got to do, if we're not getting to where we need to go, is we need to know how. What is the thing that we really need to know? So, for example, I coach a lot of coaches. And one of the things that coaches often ask me is, how can I start getting clients? How can I start getting clients? And typically, we've got to accept that they're not getting clients. We've got to detach from the behaviors that are not getting clients. Um, Let me give you a quick conversation I had with a coach recently. I asked her, what are you actually doing to get clients? And she said, I'm posting on Facebook every single day. And I said, okay, how long have you been doing that? And she said, I've been doing it for over a year now. And I said, what sort of things are you posting on Facebook? And she said, I'm posting positive um, affirmations. I'm posting, um, you know, positive sayings. I'm posting uh, things that I've been taught, little uh, inspirational things that I've been taught. And I said, okay, so what was, what's the result that you're getting from all of that for over a year? And she said, nothing. And I said, okay, we've got to go down to the detached part. That's not serving you. What you are doing is not working and you're wasting a lot of time. And she agreed with that. She had wasted hundreds of hours, you know, over a year getting no result. So now we're going to go to the skill point. We're going to say, okay, so what skill do you need or what do you need to do in order to change the game? And so we then, I introduced her to things that we've been doing for years that have been very successful in getting lots of clients and showed her how to do that. And much of that required a bit of extra skill. She had to not only know what to do, but she also needed to build her skill. Something in the context of a lot of coaches, what they have to add as a skill is they sometimes have to add marketing or have a marketer. Or something they've got to do is add the ability to be able to sell their value, you know, and that equally can be a skill. So basically, the first thing we do is accept what is. Second thing is we detach from what isn't serving us. (coughs) Excuse me. And um, a success strategy is have some water. Ah, Thank you. So um, the third thing is decide what you need to do. What do you need to do to make it work? And do you need an extra skill? Or do you need to get someone who has an extra skill to actually help you? And this is what I call the road to mastery. So honesty at the end of the day gives you freedom. And I'm going to get you into an exercise. So I'm going to get you to think about what must I accept that I've been denying? So what's something that I must accept that is absolutely true, that perhaps I've even been denying or lying to myself or not being honest with myself? So what is that thing that I really need to accept? The second question to ask yourself is, what do I need to release? You know, what do I need to let go of? You know, what do I have to stop doing and why? You know, and the answer to that is, Perhaps it's just not getting me anything. It's not getting me to where I really needed to get to. 
One thing I've learned over the years is that, you know, I, I coach a lot of people who are in their 50s and 60s and even people in their 70s. And quite often what they say is they often share with me is they say, Rick, I wish I had done this years ago because I've been denying that what I've been doing hasn't been helping at all and I haven't really got to really where I wanted to get to. And the biggest disappointment was I really thought I would be much further ahead in my life than I am now. So that's the acceptance point. And then you've got to work out what are they, what have they been doing over and over again or what or many things that they've been doing that hasn't actually worked. And it might not be that the thing they're doing won't work. It's just that they quit at the first piece of failure or they quit at the second or the third and they never persisted. So it's not always about getting rid of something that you have tried. It might just be that it's just not working you know, or you've quit. Now, the next question is, when am I going to decide to actually do what it takes? You know, when am I actually going to decide to do what it takes? And what skill am I missing? And who knows how? So what I'm going to do is all of these questions are in your manual. Let me just go back. They're between page 15 and 16, and I'm just going to go to my manual. And uh, so pages 15 and 16, you'll see some blue boxes there. And I want you to perhaps answer some of these questions, if you can, you know, now write them down, think about the area that you really want to create a breakthrough, and then answer those questions with a level of honesty. What I'm also going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to go into, if you're open to this, to sit down with someone else and just have a little bit of a chat about this, you know, just a little bit of a conversation about, you know, what are some of the things that you need to change and just have a bit of a chat and then we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop share and... I'm going to go to gallery and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little opportunity for a breakout. So let's see. So I'm going to open up all the rooms and just have a little chat with someone who you meet in the room and we'll keep the rooms the same. So you can, the rooms are now all open. So feel free to just go into the room. Sometimes it helps to hear from someone else. So jump into the room and have a little bit of a chat going through those particular questions. So one of you, if you want, can even be a coach. Ask the other person those questions so you can at least get some answers to this because I think it's really important that you have these pieces so we can move on to the next thing. So all you have to do to get in the break, breakout rooms is you just have to go down to the, the four little squares and you'll see the breakout rooms there and just click on that and a little pop-up should come and then you just join. You just click the join button and you should be able to go into a breakout room. So I'm just going to stop recording just for anything like that. Cool. Welcome back, folks. Everyone's starting to come back. Did anyone get any incredible awarenesses? Anything that you became incredibly aware of that is something that you have to change, shift, or, or you know, change, alter in any particular way? Yes, Andre. Oh, you're muted, buddy. I've just realized today, um, you know, I've done all the programs and that, and I'm realizing that with this breakthrough, all this is culminating. And I'm getting a lot of questions answered, and I'm getting to be able to answer my own questions. And with the appointments I've made and the coaching I've had, I've now found that uh, I'm getting the answers. That's fantastic. Of where, of where I need to be going. Yeah, that is awesome. Well, I mean, 
When I put together Breakthrough, I, I knew that I, I would have a lot of my students join it. And uh, I wanted to be able to put it together in a way that gave you guys value too. Because like for you, Andre, you've done, you've done break, well, you haven't done a breakthrough, now you have, but you've done NLP prac, you've done masters, you've done speakers, you've done trainers. So you're highly skilled. You've got so many skills. And, and I felt that putting this together you know, I would get people like yourself coming into Breakthrough and I wanted to make sure that it gave you guys value too. So thank you. I'm really glad you you shared that. No, it has been uh, very enlightening. Awesome. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. Now, does anyone else have any questions or anything you want to share at all? I agree with Andre. It's it's been really helpful. It's nice, you know. It uh, puts a lot of things together and reminds you of other things you learned in the past. So yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. Thank you, Connie. I mean, you too. Um, you know, you've done a huge amount of training in your life as well, and you know, you're you're a counselor. You you know NLP. You you know quite a lot of modalities, and you've got a lot of insights into this space. So that's fantastic. It's a wonderful compliment from you too. Thank. So, Thanks for putting this on. Really lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I've decided I'm going to do more of these. You know, it's it's something that uh, we were having a bit of a conversation while you guys are, were in the breakout rooms. And it's something that I've realised that I love doing. You know, I love giving. I love teaching. I love sharing. And, you know, and, and it's beautiful. I've seen a lot of old faces here too. You know, um, old friends from the past. So it's it's a delight opportun- delightful opportunity to be able to reconnect with you, which is awesome. So I'm a bit mindful of time. We've got about eight more minutes. So I'm going to aim to, you know, give you some more so we can prepare you for tomorrow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to sharing screen and let's continue our journey. So um, the thing that I want to share from here is um, the the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk a little bit, and I'm so glad we got to this bit because I wasn't sure whether we were going to. I thought this was going to be content for tomorrow. So I want to share about how to ascend, how to really get beyond your limits and understand the relationship between frequency and emotions. So the thing that I want to share firstly is we spoke earlier about frequency. So frequency is, for example, gamma. Gamma is a frequency. It's higher than 30 hertz. So it's at a point when we're really, really concentrating and, you know, focusing and learning. Now, a lot of people believe, and and I think quite falsely, that gamma is great for learning. Um, Yes, I think gamma is good, but personally, I prefer alpha when I'm learning. So what we've got at the left is the type and range, and at the right, we've got what it does. So basically, we've got gamma, which is high frequency, and you can see the graph in the middle. It shows you, you know, the highs and the lows, and also the amount of movement in space of time. So what we now get is beta waves, which starts to lower in frequency. So you're sitting at around 13 to 30 hertz. That's beta, beta consciousness. Beta consciousness is, you know, usually while we're awake and pretty much our brainwave patterns most of of the time. Alpha is when we start to relax. Alpha is when we start to um, prepare ourselves for sleep, for example, And, uh, you know, it starts at about 8 hertz and it goes up to about 13, 14 perhaps, and it's where we're relaxed and we're sleepy. But this is where we can start to get things in our mind. You know, it allows things to now move into our brain. We can actually program ourselves in alpha, so it's a really useful way to be. Here we don't have a lot of control, theta. Theta is when we're usually asleep. It's usually at the point that we are in REM, you know, rapid eye movement. You'll, we're usually in the dream state. 
at this particular point and uh, we are typically asleep. And then delta waves. Delta waves is when we're in deep, 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 deep sleep. The more delta you can get in your evenings uh, while you're sleeping, the more energized you will be, the more rest you will get. I discovered this when I started working on uh, the genius brain and I decided to, uh, I, I decided I was going to be insatiable in my study. So I had just learned neurolinguistic programming. I was now going into learning NLP master practitioner training and I wanted to really master my mind. So I felt that I only had about, you know, anywhere between eight to 12 hours in my day to really get good. And I decided I wanted more. So I decided I was going to sleep less. So what I ended up doing is I started listening to a lot of audios, a lot of hypnotherapy. And uh, while I would sleep is I would be listening to audios that would take me right down to alpha and then to theta. And I also wrote some that allowed me to go really deep into delta sleep. So when I listened to those, I would wake up usually at about three in the morning, sometimes four in the morning. And it was like I was awake at seven or eight in the morning. I was fully rested completely. So I would just get out of bed and I would you know, study and do what I had to do. And I got so much done. Like I was like a man possessed. I was kind of working like two jobs. You know, I was like doing two people's work um, because I was sleeping very, very little. And it was the key was getting myself down into Delta. Now that's one way. That's one way in your moving from consciousness to unconsciousness. But now I want to give this to you in another way. So that is that line, of course, is that just marks where we go to sleep. So now when we talk about frequency, I want to introduce my primitive friend here. And I want to talk about what is suffering right up to what might be ultimate consciousness you know, the beginning and the end, which is called alpha and omega. So if we now look at this frequency and we say to ourselves, okay, so what frequency is what emotion? And there's been so much science in this particular area. And what they have concluded is that when we are at 20 hertz, now all of these are conscious. All of these are conscious. This is now gamma and beyond. So at 20 hertz, that equates to shame. So when our physiology is vibrating at about 20 hertz, we are usually in a very shameful state. So if we increase that by about 20 hertz, we might be in an emotion called guilt. If we go to 50 hertz, we start moving to apathy, not caring. When we go 25 hertz at 75 hertz, we now move to what might be described as grief. At 100 hertz, we're at fear, like we're scared. We're really scared. When we go to 125, we now bring in an element called desire. Doesn't mean we've got it. It's a little bit what I was referring to before, the I am statements versus the I wish you know, I should, I have to, I must statements where it desire. Then we're at 150 hertz where it anger. So now we're starting to get quite active. Most of these others, all below anger, are very passive. This is where people retreat. This is where people will hide in their rooms, hide in their homes, don't go out socially, and so forth. But anger is when people come out of their cocoon, but not in a good way. So another 25 hertz to 175, we now start to move to pride. Now you might think pride is a very positive emotion. It's not really. Pride in oneself, someone might argue, is a good thing. 
I think pride actually can be a dangerous thing. Having too much pride can often have people never say sorry, never forgive, never forget. When we go up to 200 hertz, we're at a point of courage. Now, we acknowledge that at at halfway mark, 200 to 100, we still have fear. It doesn't mean that courageous people don't have fear. It's just now we're very active. We're now saying, I'm scared, but I'm still going to do it. At 250 hertz, we're at finally at a point of neutrality. You know, this is when there is really not a great deal of emotion at this particular space. We're just in a very neutral point. Now we can do some things. 310, we're at willingness. The gift that you were given at birth is you were given what's called free will. This is when you use your free will. This is when you make decisions, you know, at a point of willingness. And then we go 350, we move to a point of acceptance. We accept things that they are and we engage our will and we now have reasons for doing what we're doing. So we actually have justifiable reasons for moving forward at 400 hertz. So you can see that if you really want to start moving, you've got to get your frequency up about 200 hertz and beyond. Now, those of you that are big fans of people like Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins is a big fan of energy. He believes that energy is everything, you know, really ramping up your energy. Now, I agree with him, you know, in that when we can ramp up our state, we can really bring about energy. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking at great length about that and learning some techniques to increase your energy energy dramatically. So 500 hertz, we're at a position of love. I would argue that at 500 hertz, anything is possible. When you are in a state of love, you can do anything. If you're in love with your business, you can do anything. If you're in love with another person, you too can do anything. If you are in love and passionate, you care about who you are and what you do. The only reason here I am 21 years on from, you know, starting out as a coach, the only reason I am still a coach is I am still in love with coaching. I love coaching. I love helping people. The only reason I'm here doing breakthroughs is because I love this stuff, because it makes all the difference in the world. The only reason I market like crazy when I do things like breakthrough is I want the world in this training. And sure, there are people not here, they're on Facebook Live and they're on YouTube Live and watching it, you know, so thank you too to all of you that are not here, so thank you. But the thing is, I love what I do. So if you can can stop listening to the shoulds, the have tos, the musts, stop listening to your head and start listening to your heart, you will find yourself in a much happier space and place And you will start doing things because you are in love with what you're doing. So at 540 hertz, yes, you can go beyond love to joy. And you can move to such a joyous space that this is where manifesting really begins. So if you've ever wondered, you know, how do you manifest? You know, some of you have heard one of my stories where I went from being down to my last $27 to making millions of dollars, it all happened when I manifested, when I changed my mindset and I got to a joyous place and I manifested. So hence I've got, you know, the guy sitting there with his laptop in, you know, in the mantra position in meditation. But it's, it's a symbol. It's basically when you can get yourself to a very Zen place. 600 hertz is peace. And my father used to say to me, you know, my father was in a depression, grew up in an orphanage, um, was a soldier in World War II. He used to say to me as, as when I was growing up, he said, son, all I want is peace. The reason he couldn't get there is because he was so angry still about the war and the depression. And, you know, he he had a sense of pride. But he, he got himself, the family moments, the times that we spent a lot of time with the family, you know, eating, chatting, laughing, 
they were the moments that he was in peace, but he had to get rid of his anger. At 700 to 1,000 hertz, you are at the position of enlightenment. You know, you are in a great, great space. Now, there are people that actually claim now to go beyond 2,000 hertz, but these people have been meditating for almost most of their lives. And they have gotten themselves to a very, very, very deep level of meditation. And you can certainly get there, no doubt. So the thing is that here at these levels, these are low frequencies and they're the frequencies that essentially create your limits. From that, these frequencies, these are the frequencies that I would call abundant frequencies. Now, at the very end of today, what I'm going to give you, I'm going to find it really quickly. I'm going to give you a link. It's a link, um, which is a, a, an audio that anyone can listen to. It's completely free. And it's an audio that I listen to a lot. And it helps me to get into an abundant frequency. And it's a, some of you may have already uh, have listened to the audio. It's called Abundance Beyond Limits. It's on my YouTube channel. And if, you, if you're not on my YouTube channel, I suggest that you subscribe to it. So whenever we create new videos like the abundant frequencies, that you can get them. And of course, YouTube will notify you whenever we do new videos. And so that is where at the top level, that is where you manifest incredible things. Now, sure, you could be argued that you are manifesting the entire way through, but at the lower level frequencies, you are certainly manifesting things, but they're the things that you probably don't want to manifest into your life. So from that particular perspective, it kind of looks a little bit like this. If at low levels, I'll just go back. If you are in anger, desire or fear, and let's call that about 150 down to 100 hertz or below, let's call them bad vibrations. What happens is you project bad vibrations out into your present and your future. So in other words, you know, a person might be really angry. And what happens is when you are really angry, you're only going to bring more anger to you or more opportunities to be angry. So therefore, you might end up in a horrible space. You know, particularly if you're angry in a car on the road, it's definitely a, a disastrous combination. So basically, these tell you, these become markers. If I can go back just a step, these markers tell you that if you're angry, your frequency is about 150 hertz. If you're at a position of love, if you're feeling love for yourself and others in the world, you are probably around 500 hertz. So these words, which I've put in your manual, by the way, just so you can get a sense that if you are feeling any of these feelings, it just tells you what your frequency is. That's all. And, you know, tomorrow what I want to do is I want to show you how to lift your frequency. So that is essentially how we're going to do it. Now, you've heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together. And you know that like attracts like. Of course, you know, you may have studied manifestation or, you know, the law of abundance and all of those sorts of things. But the real value is when you practice it. So birds of a feather flock together. You know, depressed people find other depressed people. Usually they don't find people. They find movies, songs, stories. You know, depressed people read a lot of depressing novels. Depressed people watch a lot of depressing movies. Depressed people read a lot of depressing poetry or, you know, expose themselves to depressing situations. Whereas people who are in a space of joy will attract more people who are joyous to them. And so that's essentially where I want to take you to. So tomorrow, what we're going to do is we're going to start doing the now deeper level work. Tomorrow, we're going to start talking about, okay, so we know this. We know our senses lock in ideas, concepts of who we are. 
We know vibration is a marker to tell us exactly where we're feeling, as is language, as is all of these things. Tomorrow, I'm now going to take you through, there's going to be a lot less that I'm going to share from a knowledge perspective. However, I will always, when we're doing techniques and processes, I'm going to explain what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, what you could expect as a result. But tomorrow is breakthrough day. Tomorrow, I want you to bring those things that you want to shift. Bring those things that you want to change. And let's do the inner work tomorrow. So it's going to be, just to give you a bit of a sense of this, it's going to be more sort of group work. So all you'll have to do a lot of the time is you, you can just stay muted. You can even turn your camera off. I'm going to be doing most of the work tomorrow. So I'm going to be taking you through processes. I'm going to be giving you some insights. And tomorrow, the purpose and intent is to have you get an aha. If you haven't had an aha today, then tomorrow is the day that I want you to really get, oh, my God, that's what I need to do, or really get a shift of paradigm, you know, not only perhaps an aha, but a shift of paradigm. Or ultimately, it would be awesome if you could get a shift of feeling. So you feel so much different. Um, Rachel, who I want to thank again for volunteering today. Rachel, when I asked her, what do, you, what do you get a sense of after doing the process? She said, I feel lighter. That's typically what most people will say when they go through a breakthrough. They will often say, I feel lighter. I feel different. In truth, we do not have an extended vernacular, a language for transformation. We really don't have a big language for it. In fact, most of the language that we hear is very fear-based, particularly if you watch a lot of news, if you listen to a lot of ads, if you, you know, watch a lot of television, the vernacular that we hear is very fear-based transformation, which a lot of people, that there, there, there aren't as many television programs that are transformational based like this. There are a hell of a lot of programs which are drama filled. And drama makes people's emotions go down so that they can bring them up. Then they go down, bring them up, down, bring them up. If you think of watching TV, the news is always very somber and very about this low tone. Why? Because when it gets to the, oh, what a feeling, it's a massive contrast. It sells a ton of cars. So that's why the environment is what it is. So there aren't too many transformational examples in the world. You know, I wish there was a lot more transformational TV. It would make a big difference. So the thing that you've got to understand is we're going to create the conditions. We're going to create the conditions of a transformation. Today was what day? Tomorrow's how day. So we have gone a little bit over time, about 15 minutes almost. So I'm going to thank you, thank you, thank you hugely for joining us today. Thank you again to Rachel for volunteering. And uh, please, I hope to see you tomorrow. Of course, it's completely up to you. You don't have to come tomorrow. It's not mandatory. No one is forcing you at gunpoint. Um, however, I would love you to come tomorrow. And it's completely up to you. So thank you so much. Um, feel free to unmute and uh, give yourselves a huge round of applause for being here today. So thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you so Rick. much. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, You're welcome. Thanks, team. Thank, thank, thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. much. Have, Have a good folks. weekend. Have an amazing, amazing Saturday, folks. Get out and enjoy thank yourself. You. Bye. Catch some waves. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay, bye, folks. Mm -hmm.